Good afternoon to you and greetings in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. It is a joy to be here today. It is a joy to know the love and power of Christ. The power with which he raised Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Wow. I'm very happy to share some thoughts and scriptures this afternoon concerning the resurrection of the dead. I appreciate being given an opportunity to choose the topic out of many wonderful choices that were suggested. <laughs> and this was my first choice, the resurrection of the dead. When you reach my age, a lot of people of your own generation have gone on. <laughs> and you begin to think about the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> a lot of people who are very dear to you, you're not going to see again if there's no resurrection because they're gone from this world. But if we believe that Christ rose from the dead, then also them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Amen. And if you're sure that Christ is going to rise from the dead, you can be awful sure of that. Then that sure you may be, that confident you may be, that we also may rise. For we rise with him. Amen. If he's there, we're going to be there too. Because we're with him. I like that. Amen. I would like to read a pair of scriptures at the beginning. I'm going to read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 15. Brother Edwin Strong was um, president of Ozark Bible College for six years, worked with Brother Seth Wilson. He was the minister at the Villa Heights Christian Church in Joplin, Missouri for 25 or 30 years. I love that man. Oh boy. But uh, he used to, when he still had a voice, he used it for the Lord. He doesn't have a voice anymore. And, even though he's still with us in body, partially. But he used to drill his uh, young people by asking them, what book and chapter is the faith chapter? What book and chapter is the love chapter? <laughs> now you could answer those, couldn't you? Yes, yes, of course. And he had a long list of scripture passages that he would uh, teach the young people uh, to locate by responding orally when he'd ask the question. And um, if I were going to ask you, this is Brother Strong he used to ask, what is the resurrection chapter? What do you suppose his answer was that he wanted? 1 Corinthians 15. Well, uh, teach your young people that if they're not here today. But uh, I would add to that perhaps uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That has a substantial paragraph about the resurrection in it. And I'm going to begin by uh, referring to the passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now you really ought to have this passage memorized. If you don't, shame on you. Get with it. Do it. You can memorize it in 5-10 minutes if you'll set your mind to it. Right? Okay. Uh, and uh, You'll love it all your life. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, so that you sorrow not like others who have no hope. For if we believe that God, uh, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who are asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you, not by our guesses, not by our philosophy, but this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall in no way, no means, precede, that is, go ahead, 
of those that sleep. Why not? For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. I don't know whether they'll top over the to topple over the tombstones or <laughs> what, but the dead in Christ are going to rise then. We that are alive and remain shall together with them be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Wow. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Now, if that won't comfort you, you're a lost case. <laughs> That's for sure. Well, I think you see why you ought to memorize that passage. That's too good not to know. And um, I go now to the chapter which is entirely devoted to the subject of the resurrection, both Christ's resurrection and the resurrection of the dead. And I want to read part of 1 Corinthians, 3, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Verses 12 and 13, we'll read these two verses. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, and the preceding section talked about the evidences for Christ's resurrection, how do some among you say, there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not raised. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is vain, just hot air, just nothing, worthless. And your faith is vain. It won't help you when you come down to get that last gasp. No way. Well, I shall skip down reluctantly, but I'll skip anyway. Down to verse 35. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up? How are you going to raise the dead? Impossible. With what kind of a body do they come? Well, now that's, uh, uh, that, that's a real uh, tough question to some people. Doesn't bother me any, but uh, I could imagine some <laughs> difficult uh, examples. I suppose some poor old guy, or maybe he's not so poor, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. But some guy dies, dies at sea and they pitch him over the side of the ship not having a grave of dirt, uh, and uh, his carcass is devoured by several sharks who tear him apart, and then the fisherman comes along and catches the sharks and grinds them up into cat food and disperses them uh, uh, to several cans, several cats. Uh, now that ought to be gross enough right after dinner, shouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> if that isn't gross, I'm not capable of being gross. Uh, what, how are you going to raise him from the dead? Well, uh, we're going to talk about that subject here in a little bit, but some people might consider that quite a problem. Paul said when they asked him that question, foolish one. I think that's spoken more in uh, sympathy and pity than it is in anger. Foolish one. What you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow the body that shall be. You don't sow a beautiful green wheat stalk about that tall. You just sow a little old brown shriveled up hard <laughs> uh, kernel of wheat. Uh, you don't sow what comes up. Uh, <laughs> that, that you don't do. But mere grain, perhaps wheat, some other grain. But God gives it a body as he pleases. That's right. To each seed its own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's flesh of fish that's adapted to swimming. There's flesh of birds that's made to fly. <laughs> uh, there are people who are adapted to very cold weather. And people who seem to be adapted to hotter weather. All flesh is not the same flesh. There's one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another fish, another birds. There are also celestial bodies, angelic beings, people who have died, and terrestrial bodies, bodies adapted to living on the earth. The glory of the celestial is one. The glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, 
Another glory of stars, for one star differeth from another in glory. Thus also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. If we don't bury our dead, no matter how much we love them, uh, in a day or two, uh, they'll look like uh, roadkill. I mean, we just well face it. Uh, like Lazarus' body, he has been dead four days and he stinketh. Uh, we love Lazarus, but uh, he stinketh. It is sown in uh, uh, it is sown in corruption. That's rotten decay. It is raised in incorruption, never to die. It is sown in dishonor. That's why we bury it. Either bury it or smell it. Uh, one or the other. Uh, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Now some of us have quite a ways to go for our bodies to look real glorious. Uh, we've never won any Mr. America contests or Miss America and uh, haven't even been entered as a candidate. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, is sown in, um, uh, it, it is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. We had a la dear lady, Mrs. Nichols, in a church where I served down in Arkansas, and she was a very ugly woman. She was short and stubby and had two or three big old uh, warts on her face and she was wrinkled. But this dear sister took care of her grandchildren who had practically been abandoned by their parents. She took care of a lot of the church's people, church kids. She walked to church on, on uh, bad weather days when people in cars wouldn't come. In the resurrection, she will be beautiful. And I thought she, I thought she was beautiful already. She had a beautiful spirit. I loved her. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural body. Now the natural body is animated by blood. The life is in the blood. If you're about to die, the doctor gives you a blood transfusion because the life is in the blood. But uh, he says it is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. Jesus said a spirit does not have flesh and blood like you see me having. In the resurrection, our body will not be animated by the life which is in the blood, but by the eternal spirit which God has and lets us share. And as far as I can tell, there will be no limitations of time, space, or memory. Won't that be nice? That no leakage of memory. Woo! That'll be nice. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Now this I say, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I cannot get into heaven in my present body. When Christ comes back, we're going to be transformed. This body with its pimples and its rotten teeth and hearing aids and glasses and I won't list all my medical ailments. <laughs> You've got your own list. Uh, this body is going to be transformed. Our body is subject to the curse that God put upon the world at the time of Adam. God said, dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. And the whole creation was subject to to vanity and weakness and disorder. I had a doctor friend, a pediatrician from Mesa, Arizona, and his job in that big pediatric hospital out in Mesa, Arizona was to examine newborns. He said he, that was his job, to examine every newborn baby that was in that hospital. And he said, you might be surprised to know that there's no such thing as a perfect baby. Now you might say, he should have seen my baby. <laughs> he should have seen my granddaughter. Oh, well, uh, the good doctor, in the kindness of his heart, said there's no such thing as a perfect baby. They've all got something wrong with them somewhere. It may not be a serious, life-threatening ailment, but something's not according to the norm. And in this world, uh, we're born to die, and we start dying the day we're born, almost. Uh, maybe even before then. But 
uh, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption, that's rotten decay and smell, inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the blinking of an eye, in the twinkling of an eye. I see one, I see somebody's eyes sparkle, and behold, I'm changed. Uh, we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead shall rise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal body must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall it be brought to pass what is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? You don't have any. Now, oh, De oh Hades, where is your victory? <laughs> you thought you'd won, you lost. The sting of death is sin. That's what makes death, pain, makes death painful. I had a cousin that died recently. He was a very personable young man in his 40s. Now, to me, that's very young. Uh, my apologies to you teenagers. Uh, but anyway, uh, he was a very personable fellow, very talented musician, very popular, but he died of cancer. He had never accepted the Lord. And the thing which made his death painful was that he wasn't ready to go to meet the Lord. If you're ready to go meet the Lord, Death's not so painful. In fact, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, immovable, Always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain to the Lord, your bones going to rise again. I like that. Uh, John Raymond used to sing to his Old Testament history class, damn bones going to rise again. Now, part of the song is pure silliness, but uh, uh, the uh, line that they kept repeating uh, is true. And I started to get a kick out of driving along the road and seeing the cemetery and shaking my fist at it and saying, them bones are going to rise again. Well, that's true. <laughs> uh, it really is. Now, the resurrection of the body is a certainty. Amen. It is a certainty. Our Lord Jesus uh, taught us that it is a certainty. The Sadducees came around to Jesus. You can read about this in... All, all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and uh, proposed to Jesus a hypothetical question of how uh, one woman married seven men. All of them died off. She was a deadly woman. Uh, but anyway, uh, whose wife was she going to be in the resurrection? And Jesus said, You do greatly err. You make a big, you greatly err knowing neither the scriptures nor the power of God. And anybody who denies the resurrection doesn't know the scriptures, including the Old Testament, nor the power of God. You don't know it. <laughs> and Jesus said in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given marriage. No sex in heaven. Well, uh, uh, Don DeWell used to say, are you sure you're going to like this? Well, yes, he liked it. Uh, that was uh, not the problem. But anyway, Jesus said, but to prove to you that the dead do rise, he said, didn't you ever read back in the book of Exodus chapter 3 where uh, God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now when Moses was living, God spoke to Moses. Abraham had been dead 600 years. <laughs> Isaac about 400, Jacob about 200, not quite 200. But God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, I am the God. Amen. 
And because their spirit is still living with God, Jesus extrapolated to the conclusion then that their bodies also would live at some time. And he carried that out. Jesus taught that there was a resurrection. The Apostle Paul was real keen on this. He said to the, uh, to the governor uh, Festus, I have a hope in God, which they themselves, referring to his adversaries, the Jews, also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. That was his hope. Paul repeated uh, uh, that same statement in other passages where uh, he spoke about how that he had a hope in the resurrection. And he said, for example, the Sadducees, uh, when Paul was meeting with the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sadducees didn't believe there was any resurrection or angel or spirits, and nothing but this world. Paul cried out in the council and said, Men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead I'm being judged. Well, uh, we'll not discuss whether Paul was telling the whole story or not there, but uh, at least what he said was true. <laughs> the resurrection of Christ was the topic of dispute. In the Old Testament, there was a lot stated about the future life and the resurrection. Now, if any of you have been Bible students, you know that I just stated something which is not true. Only it is true. <laughs> I find a lot of people say the Old Testament doesn't say anything about the future life. Well, it doesn't say much. For Christ has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen. And without New Testament Christianity, the Old Testament religion did not make people perfect. Apart from us, the saints of the Old Testament were not made perfect. So, sure, they didn't know much about immortality, but they knew a little about it. They knew, in fact, they knew quite a little about it. I have a quotation here from the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. Generally, this is a very reliable set of books. But uh, if you read their article on the resurrection, remember the words of Paul when he said, test all things. Uh, this needs testing very bad because there's some slag in the silver and gold. Uh, anyway, uh, some tin in the silver. But he said that here in this, the doctrine of the resurrection appeared late in the history of the Israelite religion. Well, Jesus said Moses believed it. Anyway, and he said uh, right here that... Um, Death is not celebrated, and the occasional Old Testament references to offering be made to, to the dead. Um, Israel probably encountered the Persian belief in the resurrection during the Babylonian exile. Well, that's horrible. Neither does the Old Testament religion derive a doctrine of the afterlife from a theory of rewards and punishments. That's terrible, terrible, terrible. I could show you some other things about this. But I'd like to give you about, oh, three or four scriptures here from the Old Testament on the resurrection. Oh, these are, these are wonderful passages. I like these. I love Psalm 1715. Woo! If you're wide awake, you can open that up with me. Uh, if you're asleep, uh, sleep on. Uh, he that... Uh, Sleep, you know, scripture, sleep on and take your rest. <laughs> anyway, uh, the, but uh, Psalm 17, 15 uh, says this. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Don't tell me they didn't believe in a future life. Did you get that one? Psalm 17, 15. Wow, I like that. We go back even further to the song of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. Bless her saintly heart. Lord, give us more, more Hannahs. <laughs> Maybe we'll have more Samuels if we have more Hannahs. In fact, I know we'll have more Samuels if we have more Hannahs. But in, in uh, 
the song of Hannah in 1 Samuel 2. She talked about how the Lord was going to uh, put down the mighty, lift up the humble, and she said in um, 1 Samuel 2.6, 1 Samuel 2.6, the Lord kills, the Lord makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. Now these modern translations give me some of, this one's a pretty good translation. This is the New King James Version of the Old Testament, which personally I think is the most accurate Old Testament available in English, but that's a judgment call you don't have to agree with me on if you don't want to. But when it says here, he brings down to the grave and brings up, the Hebrew word translated grave here is Sheol. It's the place of the dead. It's not just the grave. But even if he is just referring to the grave, it says that he brings up from the grave. Amen. Hannah believed the doctrine of the future life. She sure did. And I'm grateful for that. Then, then we have the two people who never died but were taken out of this world. Who were they? Enoch and Elijah. The very fact that they departed from this world without dying surely suggested to everybody who knew about it that there was a life beyond this one. They went somewhere. <laughs> a tornado just didn't blow them away and deposit them on a mountain, as the sons of the prophets thought, but couldn't find them. <laughs> They'd still be looking with them. Uh, and uh, then Job 19.25. Woo! The book of Job may be the oldest book in the Old Testament. It may go way back to the time of the patriarchs. But Job in his distress said, But as for me, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And at the last day he will stand upon the earth, whom I shall see on my side. And, my, and, and I shall see with my eyes and, and from my eyes I shall see, and from, I'm misquoting it, and from my flesh I shall see God. Now I am seeing you from right up here. In case you hadn't noticed, I'm up here and you're down there. All right, from up here, I'm seeing you. Job said, from my flesh. And that is literally the way the Hebrew words that. I can show you some parallel passages where that exact grammatical phrase, from something, he saw something. It's always the point of view from which the viewing is done. So Job believed that after his skin had been eaten by worms, from his flesh he would see God. Whew, I like that. <laughs> Don't you like that? I'm sure I like that. And. One of the favorite Old Testament passages on the resurrection is Psalm 49, 15. Oh my, Psalm 49 is an incredibly beautiful psalm. And I, I just invite you, if you want to, uh, to look with me at Psalm 49. He talked in this psalm about the people who thought they were going to live forever. They named their property after their family names. <laughs> then when they die, it goes to somebody else. Uh, but uh, he says here in Psalm 49, Psalm 49, verse 15, But God will, re will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Here it is. It's Sheol again. God will redeem my soul from the power of the unseen world. For he shall receive me. Uh, Charles Spurgeon had a comment, uh, or sort of a little poetic line about this psalm. Return to the dust, I shall. Raise from the dust, he will. Live forever, I shall. I like that. And one more. How many times do I have to prove this case? <laughs> The Old Testament said a whole lot more about the future life than a lot of people are aware of. And that's why Jesus said, if you don't believe 
in eternal life, you don't even believe the Old Testament scriptures, much, much less what he said about it. That's for sure. But in uh, Hosea 13, 14, oh, I read this passage a while ago, whether you know it or not. I, I quoted, it's quoted by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul quotes Hosea, Hosea 13, 14. And this is the good word from Brother Hosea. I will redeem you. I will redeem them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh, death. Now, this translation says, I will be your plagues. That's not a good translation. The good translation says, oh, death, where is your sting? We could go into that sometime. Oh, grave, I'll be your destruction. Well, uh, surely, surely that's more than enough passage to prove my point. Now, at the time of our death, we put off this earthly tabernacle, which we have to cart off to the doctor <laughs> and the dentist uh, and all the other people. And the apostle Peter said, I think it is right as long as I'm in this tent. His body is like a tent. Uh, the tent is different from the occupant in the tent, thanks be. <laughs> uh, the occupant in the tent is much superior to the tent itself. Uh, but anyway, I think it is right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that I must put off my tent. Just as our Lord Jesus showed me. So there's something inside of you that the gravedigger can't bury. <laughs> the martyr Stephen knew this. As he was being stoned and pounded to death, he said, he looked up and saw heaven open and he said, Lord Jesus, lay not this sin to their charge. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Devout men carried Stephen to his burial with great lamentation. But his spirit went on to be with Jesus. Ooh, that's so wonderful. And 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 8. We are always confident. Knowing we are always con confident, yea, well pleased, we are rather to be absent from the body. Now you all are present in the body today, even if you're asleep. If I would come back and give you a pinch, you'd probably let me know that you were present in the body. <laughs> like giving me a punch in the snoot. You'd find out I was present in the body. Uh, but <laughs> uh, as long as we are present in the body, we are absent from the Lord, at least as far as being face to face is concerned. We are willing, rather, therefore, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing to him at all times. Another scripture which says the same things, Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 23. Paul says, I'm hard-pressed. I'm in a quandary. Uh, having a desire uh, between the two, that is, between living and dying, having, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, but it is more needful to remain in the flesh for your sake. So we put off our earthly tabernacle at the time of our death. Ecclesiastes said, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. The silver cord of life ties body and soul together. And the time is coming when if we've been as handsome as Robert Taylor, uh, we're a dead corpse. <laughs> the silver cord will be loosed the golden bowl will be broken. It will no longer carry the good word. I mentioned Brother Edwin Strong, whose voice could barely whisper now. He was an eloquent preacher at one time. Are the pitcher shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well? You can no longer run or turn. 
Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. That's the last two verses in the book of Ecclesiastes, in case you don't know where it is. But our mortal bodies will rise again. Jesus said in John chapter 5, and my, this is a verse you ought to have underlined in your Bible, and probably do, some of you probably do. John chapter 5, uh, beginning to verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is. He's not talking in this verse about the resurrection yet. The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now this verse is talking about the ones who are dead in sin, who are separated from God in this life now. But they will hear the voice of the Son of God, and they will receive the Lord Jesus, be born again, and become his brothers and sisters. And he said, do not marvel at this, what I just got through saying, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. <laughs> so there is life for the spiritually dead. There will be life for all mankind with the possibility of eternal life. Uh, our mortal bodies will rise again. The book of Romans says, if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and we receive the Holy Spirit at the time of our baptism into Christ, if the spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies. Amen. Now it's amazing to me that a lot of people don't want to believe in the resurrection. Well, if they have lived in sin, they ought to fear the idea of the resurrection because they're going to rise to damnation. I mentioned a cousin of the cousin of mine who died in his 40s. His mother was clinging on to some vain hopes. She found a book by a fellow by the name of Arthur Chambers. Uh, and. Uh, he was a Church of England clergyman, and he believed that when you died, you were liberated from your body. The body just molded to dust, but the spirit was freed from all earthly encumbrances, and your sweet self would shine forth, no more suffering, no more limitations. And in the book, he had a prayer that he spoke at the death of his mother. Almighty and eternal Father, we bless thy holy name that thou hast revealed to us by thy Son the glorious fact that those who have departed this life still live to thee, and that physical death doth, doth usher us into a more abundant life. We commend to thy loving care her whom thou hast called into higher being and experience, whose mortal body we commit to the grave. And he goes ahead to speak about how that, in the, that he believed in the world in, after death with no problems, no sins to contend with, and you could even come back and visit the living. <laughs> yes, he said that. Uh, I believe that after death we can desire, remember, sympathize, purpose, and can feel the pull of old associations and under certain conditions manifest itself to, in earth life as Christ did. In other words, you can be a spiritualist and come back and talk with the living. Well, I'm sorry you can't do it. Uh, they wouldn't let Lazarus and the rich man come back to earth. <laughs> Peter spoke about the evil men who were disobedient in the days of Noah, and he said they are in prison. Christ is not going to let a bunch of spirits come floating around, spirits of the dead come floating around, come back and talk to you. If you think you've been talking to spirits of the dead, I'm very much afraid you've been talking to some deceiving spirits who'd like to fool you into believing that. Now, you may not agree with what I say, but uh, uh, some, of you, some of you, I suspect, agree with me on that. If you don't, may the Lord enlighten your blinded eyes. Uh, but anyway, I'm 
kidding you mostly. Uh, mostly I'm kidding you. Well, our mortal bodies are going to rise again. And we will meet Jesus at the resurrection. Sometimes we sing songs about, oh, if I could hear my mother pray again. Oh, I want to hold my mother's little hand. Well, uh, me too. I want to meet my mother. She was truly a saint. I want to introduce you to her uh, sometime. I want to meet your family too. But we should be mostly concerned about meeting Jesus. Amen. I appreciated Brother Maddox's sermon this morning. He quoted 1 John 3. Beloved, now we are children of God. It is not yet made manifest what we shall be, but we know that, we shall, that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it says, when, we're, when we come out of the graves, we will meet the Lord in the air. Uh, and it is the Lord we'll meet in the air. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly await for the Savior. Now, we need to realize that Jesus is the one we really ought to meet most of all. Let's see if I can quote the old song. Oh, the dear ones in glory, how they beckon me to come. And our parting at the river I recall. Yes, we sure do. In the glad song of ages, they will sing my welcome home. But I long to meet my Savior, first of all. Amen. I shall know him, I shall know him, and redeemed by his side, I shall stand. Now, I'm not totally sure that Christ still has the prints of the nails in his hand. <laughs> uh, as I read the description of the glorified Christ in the first chapter of Revelation, he seems to be in total glory and splendor. If the nail prints are there, okay. If they're not, the power of the cross is still reality. Well, we're going to be totally sanctified in spirit and soul. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus. I have yet to meet anyone that I've ever known who when they died was absolutely perfect in all their attitudes. They could still get cranky. <laughs> uh, they could still be selfish, grasping. And just, it seems to me that this verse at least suggests that just as our body is transformed into a perfect body, that all those lingering shortcomings in our nature, our attitudes, are going to be refined. Maybe we won't have church fights in heaven. That's all we don't need in heaven is a church fight. Uh, uh, we're going to be sanctified in spirit and soul, as well as body. And that, that's wonderful. We will have come to the spirits of just men made perfect. Hebrews 12, 23. I noticed you had a daily devotion on uh, the spirits of just men made perfect. And I have a little ways to go. Even the Apostle Paul said, not yet that I am made perfect, but he was still working on it. But we're going to be sanctified. Oh, the glory of the resurrection. Thank you for singing the song at my request. That song we sang number 240 a while ago, when he shall come resplendent in his glory. You really ought to learn that. That may be a new song, but that one's going to last. <laughs> that one's going to become a standard because it's so biblical and has such beautiful harmony. Uh, and I want to walk with Christ in white. And I want to walk with you. And I want to walk with my father and my mother and with many others whom I could name. I want to... I want to close now by reading a teeny tiny little story here from the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. 
I have it right here, I think. Goodness, where did I put it? Yeah, here it is. I have it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a distinguished German theologian who was imprisoned by Hitler in World War II and executed on April 8, 1945. Before being taken out to his death, he conducted a service for his fellow prisoners at their request, and this was his text. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his mercy gave us new birth to a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. As the guards removed him, he sent this last message to the bishop. This is the end, but for me, the beginning of life.